Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Carol Musel and I'm the Dean of the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. And I'm delighted to be here today to introduce this very special program. This year, our School of Nursing celebrates the centennial, and that is when our namesake endowed to the Western Reserve University $500,000 in 1923. It's been 100 years of nursing education here in Cleveland, where we teach our students to care for the sick, to have respect for a person's dignity, to be responsible and accountable, and to collaborate with others to accomplish the goals of caring for the whole person. In that same decade that the School of Nursing was endowed, that Frances Payne Bolton made her gift, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta was starting her missionary work in India. Our guest today, Jim Tui, knows much more about Mother Teresa and will share how she cared deeply for the sick and dying, devoting her life to caring for those less fortunate and in need. The School of Nursing has 100 years of alumni who live around the world and who have also given their lives to caring for other people. Our students and alumni make a difference around the world. In October, we will celebrate our homecoming with a centennial gala where we will officially kick off a student scholarship fund which will help future students continue their incredible journey on the legacy of nursing. I look forward to seeing you in October as we continue our centennial celebration. And for now, I want to thank all of you for coming today and express my deep appreciation to Mike Shaughnessy and the team of the Marion K. Shaughnessy Nurse Leadership Academy for sponsoring this event. And now I would like to introduce Mike Shaughnessy. Thank you, Carol. Uh, before I get started, I just want to let you know I had the opportunity to, to meet Jim Tui in Washington last December at a meeting I attended. And uh, Jim spoke on his favorite subject, Mother Teresa. And uh, I was just blown away with some of his remarks and his insights and the uh, length and strength of the relationship that he enjoyed with her. And, uh, and as her, as her uh, assistance grew around the world, he was an integral part of, of, of helping her establish all the regulatory uh, requirements going into these different countries, not all of which were friendly. And uh, anyway, so Jim uh, has, is a new best friend and uh, delighted that you're here with us tonight, today, this afternoon. A few words about Jim. Jim was a, a trusted advisor and personal friend of Mother Teresa of Calcutta for 12 years and did the first reading at her massive canonization at, in St. Peter's Square. Uh, he previously headed the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community uh, Initiatives under George W. Bush for four years, served on his senior staff as well. His career spans the presidency of two Catholic colleges uh, for 13 years, seven year stint as a U.S. Senate staffer, and the leadership of Florida's 40,000 employee Health and Human Services Agency. 1996, with Mother Teresa's encouragement, he founded the nonprofit advocacy organization, Aging with Dignity, and created the Five Wishes Advanced Directive, which has sold over 40 million copies. Tui met his wife, Mary, in Mother Teresa's Washington, D.C. AIDS home and married her in 1992. They have five children, three grandchildren. He authored the book, To Love and Be Loved, The Portrait of Mother Teresa, published by Simon & Schuster. He and his wife uh, are donating the royalties uh, to charity affiliated with her life's work. Um, you'll hear more about the book, To Love and Be Loved, by, uh, uh, at the conclusion of this uh, presentation. So. With that, let me introduce you to Jim Tui. Jim, thanks for being here. Hi. Thanks a lot. Oh. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, for that nice introduction. Hearing you recite all of the my entire employment history just reminds me how 
I haven't been able to really hold down a job for any length of time. Uh, Dean Musil, thank you. I want to welcome those joining uh, by live stream as well. But thank you for the hospitality that you and Joyce and everyone has shown me since I got here in this magnificent building on this beautiful campus. And congratulations on your centennial. I introduce Valeria Tasic, who works with me at Aging with Dignity, one of Cleveland's finest, grew up in this city and uh, now works with me in Washington. So I, if you see her taking photos, it's to somehow justify the trip that she's made to come and be here. But happy to have her with me. And Mike, I just want to say uh, to be here under the sponsorship of the Nurse Leadership Academy that's named after your wife in memory of beloved Marion. I mean, what an amazing wife and mother of your daughters and nurse and professor and scholar, teacher, leader. Uh, it just reminds me uh, how her lasting legacy continues in our lives as we try to in some way put into practice what she lived to uphold human dignity and care for those sick and suffering in whatever way we we're called. I was sharing with the dean before of uh, my time as president of Ave Maria University, one of the things I was most proud of is that we started a nursing major. And uh, we started it in, and uh, it's very difficult to start from scratch a nursing program. And uh, we were able to get it accredited. We were able to find donors to build the facility, to buy these expensive mannequins that it, were essential to nurse training. And, uh, and it's now, uh, it's, it's proudly accepting 24 students a year. It's a tad smaller than here, uh, and we're not quite as world-renowned, uh, but <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe by our centennial, we'll have caught up. And if the Cleveland Clinic does its job well, that would be the year 2116, which, uh, you know, if the Cleveland Clinic continues on the cutting edge of research, I hope to be there for that uh, celebration, the ripe age of 160. Um, I know you're here because uh, of my longtime working relationship and friendship with a modern day saint, George Bush. I'm kidding, <laughs> just kidding, see if you're listening. Um, but I am here to talk about mother and then I'm going to happily answer questions that you might have. Very hard to condense into uh, somewhat brief remarks, um, a life, uh, changed by her. Um, this is the silver anniversary of her uh, going home to God. She went home to God in uh, September of 1997, and so that's when the book was launched. And, uh, and it mentions that I was her lawyer. President Bush used to love and joke about how uh, when he would introduce me at some event, he would say, Tui was Mother Teresa's lawyer. What kind of a world do we live in when even she had to have a lawyer? You know, well, but she liked to sue people. And no, I'm kidding, she didn't like to sue people. Uh, but I did help her on immigration and issues with her sisters and, and uh, permitting of the AIDS homes that she opened and so forth. And it was a privilege to see her love and compassion up front and close the last 12 years of her life. I met her in 1985 and had the opportunity to travel some with her and uh, and observe the exceptional human being that she was. The book tells the story of how she became a saint through her humanity, not in spite of it. Catholics sometimes have a bad habit of turning their saints into little plastic statues and, uh, and robbing them of what was essential about them. Uh, because what was so beautiful about Mother was her humanness. She loved life, she loved people. There are a lot of people that love God but don't love people. She saw the two as the same. And she, she loved to laugh. She liked to make her sisters laugh. She, uh, she spoke five languages. Her formal education ended at age 18, but she uh, was a lifelong learner. They have a collection of the books that she read in her lifetime in a library that's immense in Tijuana, Mexico, where the Mother Teresa Center is. And uh, she was very, uh, you know, curious. She wrote poetry. She loved to sing. Uh, she missed her friends. She cried when they died. 
Uh, she cried when she had a frustrating day. You read her journal and she would say, I had a good cry today, over, and then would describe the frustration she had. So she, she wasn't perfect. No saint is perfect, you know. Uh, she was stubborn, uh, impatient at times. Uh, she got mad at me, got angry. One time, you know, uh, we were at an outdoor mass and uh, there were thousands of people there and she was seated up front and at the sign of peace, this moment in the mass when people turn to their neighbor and wish them well. All these kids started rushing toward mother and I just jumped up because I'm going to protect her. You know, and I just said, no, no, stop, please. Uh, you know, and mother just shot, she let them come and she shot me this look. You know, I didn't turn to a pillar of salt. But uh, but I was stood there frozen and, you know, and I was told later, like, that was a sign that she liked you if she could be really direct with you and scold you and not worry about your feelings. Uh, but that was how she was. You know, she she was very, uh, you know, engaged with the world, even though she didn't watch a bit of television ever. Uh, she would pick up newspapers now and then, but she just seemed in tune with what was going on in the world and she would go and meet world leaders and she was very much very much attuned to what they were talking about uh, and the, the the challenges that the world faced if you watch your Nobel Peace Prize speech in 1979 you would see that many of the issues that she raised in that speech are playing out today and so she was in some ways prescient uh, in how the world was working and um, but when I was thinking about what to talk about today, I wanted to focus on some things. When I had dinner last night with Mike, and I was, we, we talked about Marion, I thought of the three characteristics of her life that these two women shared, a love of nursing, the joy of motherhood, and the gift of leadership, love of nursing. Uh, Mother Teresa was a nurse at heart. I mean, she spent her 20s and mid-30s, up to her mid-30s as a teacher and educator. She taught history and geography at St. Mary's School on the compound of the Sisters of Loretto Convent, uh, a very privileged group of students that lived in the boarding school. She taught in St. Mary's in the back that had the Bengali speaking students, uh, but she was an educator. And yet her eyes were wide open as she looked out into the slums during the time of turbulence in India, the partitioning of the country led to this huge migration of refugees that came with nothing. And after World War II, uh, she was already exhausted from the work she had to do because the grounds there had been turned into a, had been requisitioned into a military hospital, probably looked a little bit like you had it here during COVID, except all the beds were filled at Loretto as uh, the casualties of the war up at the coast in, in Burma. Japanese campaign there had led to a lot of Indian soldiers that were killed. 80 some thousand Indian soldiers died. India had the war declared on their behalf by Britain. And so, uh, but they pledged independence when the war was over and that's what happened. And so mother was exhausted by the care of hundreds of girls that couldn't go home, couldn't go anywhere. She rented two rooms when they were pushed out of the space on the compound and taught in one room and they slept in the other and she just made do, exhausted. And then God asks her when the war is over to go and be his light among the poor in the ghettos and slums uh, that it surrounded her. And so it was, extraordinary that uh, she feeling this call, she also felt the call to care for them and their sickness. And so she had to get the permission of her superiors, uh, religious superiors in Ireland, her archbishop in Calcutta and the Pope. And she got all three and then immediately left for nurse training. So she went to Patna 300 miles away and was three and a half months in intense nurse training by the medical mission sisters that had been doing this work in India for so many years. And so mother was uh, trained as a nurse. This was her desire to uh, care for the sick, for the lepers that were there that had been rejected by society. And then ultimately, of course, she opened the famous home for the dying there in 1952. So this was two years into her mission work when the slums slowly girls that she had taught at the school were joining her. I'll talk about that later when I talk about leadership. But uh, she became, you know, fully engaged with the care of the sick. And that home for the dying, which is on the grounds of a Hindu temple dedicated to the goddess Kali, how incongruous it would be to open a Christian home of care on the grounds of a Hindu temple. 
but at that time, that little uh, space, guest space there, they had a guest house, had been overrun by robbers and criminals that were ripping off the pilgrims. And so the government gave it to her. She was threatened, bricks through the window, threatened with death. But she started taking in the dying, and it's because she took in this one Hindu priest uh, and cared for him at the end that they realized, okay, she's a lover of humanity. It didn't matter what religion you were. And so the sisters operated that home for the dying. Fast forward to, that was in 1952, and then 33 years later, I uh, stumble into that home. I had been desiring to meet Mother Teresa. My life was uh, rife with hypocrisy. I was uh, lost. I tell the story in the book uh, of where I was when I met her at age 28. Um, and I, I wasn't living my faith. I wasn't following the gospel, but I felt, well, there's one person on earth who was Mother Teresa, and I wanted to meet her. And I was working for U.S. Senator, and I thought, well, I'm going to go and uh, cross the ocean to refugee camps on his behalf to do a tour there. The U.S. was funding them, the Indo-Chinese refugee camps in Cambodia. On the way back, I'm going to drop in and meet Mother. And I, I just want to meet her one day. And the way I talked myself into it, as I said, on the way out, I'll go to Hawaii for five days. And that's how I talked myself into it. And I didn't want to be around the poor. It was near impossible to be in Calcutta and not be around the poor. So I tell that story in the early chapters of the book and kind of parallel structure with Mother's biography. And then I meet this little tiny woman. She's about this tall, August 20th, 1985. She was everything I wasn't bright, focused, energetic, disciplined, in love with life and love with God. She was just remarkable. And it was the week she turned 75. A very important lesson for Mother Teresa's life, how aging is a blessing. It's not a curse. She embraced it. It was difficult for her. This was a woman who ultimately had five heart attacks, a stroke, tuberculosis, malaria dozens of times, broken shoulder, broken arm, broken leg, three broken ribs, uh, you know, 19 stitches in a car accident. She went through the ringer physically, you know, and as she got older, you know, in the last six months of her life, frequently hospitalized. Um, I was in her intensive care unit uh, when she was there uh, in Calcutta after a heart attack in 1996. And to see her there, you know, she just, she loved until it hurt. That was her expression, to love until it hurts. Well, that's a motto of nurses. This is why the nurses burn out so much. You know, I think I saw a study, 19, a 2022 study that 43% of nurses said they were burned out. How could they not be after COVID? Well, they could have walked from the need. They could have walked away. So what I love about this kind of facility, you are generating people in the care of others to bring their compassion to that bedside, to love until it hurts, to be present to the sick and to the suffering. That's why I titled the book To Love and to Be Loved, because Mother Teresa said that the greatest need of an individual was to love and to be loved. It was greater than food. It was greater than shelter, clothing, that fundamental human need to be loved. Well, this has been what nurses have brought to medical care from the beginning. Their loving hearts, their compassion. That word compassion literally means to suffer with, the roots of that word, to suffer with. This is what nurses, of course, did during COVID, but they've done throughout history. This was the heart of Mother Teresa and why she felt so much at home uh, in the care of others, the lepers and, and then AIDS patients. She opened that home in 1986. And, uh, and uh, by then I was hooked because I met her that day and she sent me to her home for the dying. And I showed up there thinking I was gonna get a tour. It's the only reason I went. If she had said to go there and work, I wouldn't have gone. Truthfully, there wasn't the slightest bit of me that wanted to. And I arrived there and she said, ask for Sister Luke. So I get there, I go, Sister Luke here and this nun come. I'm Sister Luke. And I said, hi, I met Mother Teresa this morning. Love dropping her name. And, uh, and she told me to come here and she said, great. Here's some cotton, here's some solution. And go and clean that guy in bed 46 that has scabies. And I just looked at it and I'm like, oh, bed 46, you know? Inside I'm like, I'm here for the tour. I, I, you know, I was busted. You know, I, there, I, I wanted to, I would have lied. To, I wanted to lie to her. I couldn't think of one. I couldn't say, well, I ha I'd love to help that man, but I have to leave. I just walked in. So I was trapped. So it was pride that sent me back there. It's why I can feel very comfortable talking about mother because it was a mercy of God that I went back to that bed. It was pride that was being 
uh, transformed, hopefully, into service. And, uh, well, mother's stubbornness and impatience were transformed into perseverance and, and single-mindedness. You know, it happens that you can have your faults changed, and hers were mine slowly, work in progress, to be sure, ask my wife, 31 years. She doesn't come here because she's mad that we're giving the royalties away. No, I'm kidding. No, she's, uh, she's home with, uh, helping with the grandkids today. Uh, but mother was, she, she just showed that in her aging experience, she saw her life as a gift, not a burden. It had trials and difficulties, which aging, it attends aging, doesn't it? As the body slowly changes. But she saw that in the midst of that, the wisdom, and she also let herself be loved. Uh, it was beautiful to see the sisters shower love upon her. Thomas Merton said one time, he said, the pride of sacrifice must give way to a humble willingness to let oneself be loved. A beautiful quote. Mother lived that and allowed these sisters to lavish uh, their love upon her, and they did. I remember in the intensive care unit, she just had had the heart attack a few days earlier. She was so weak. And I remember the sister just spoon feeding her some custard and how that was such a beautiful exchange. So uh, I just think that in, in this age that we live in where we see artificial intelligence now becoming more and more predominant and the idea that, the well, of course, artificial intelligence can compute in an instantaneous way incredible data processing and work through algorithms, and this can be placed in the service of medicine, and it should be. But if it's not tethered to humanity, if natural intelligence isn't there, if our hearts aren't engaged in healthcare, we're lost. AI cannot love. AI is incapable of loving or attending a person with the kind of compassion that only human beings can provide. And this, of course, on the front lines of care means nurses. So I, I just think that it was, uh, these little things with great love that mother did uh, brings me to her motherliness. You know, she was a mother. I know that 10% of nurses, 9%, I think, nationwide are, are men, right? So thank God for the men doing that care. I dabbled in it. I was a nurse wannabe in the AIDS home. I ended up working the AIDS home for three and a half years, taking care of the men that had AIDS in the late 80s. And um, I was, I'm indebted. I tell a bunch of stories in the book of some of the great people I met. Uh, and how mother pushed me into that work too. But uh, typically they are women and their motherliness as nurses is brought to bear. I mean, mother didn't have any children by the natural order, but she really was brought the, to bear on the sickness of individuals and their conditions, her motherly heart. It's so impressive to see her do that. I get asked a lot of time, well, what's your favorite memory of mother? And uh, And it was one day at mass in Mexico I was sitting next to her at mass, and when it was over, I had my list of things to do. It was early. She wasn't supposed to leave the convent for several hours, and so I was going to rush across the border in San Diego to get a bunch of medicines and other things that she needed. So I race out, and there's a big crowd because they had heard Mother was inside that house, and I just wanted to get a glimpse of her. This happened wherever she traveled. When I traveled with her, it was amazing to see that. Um, but she... Uh, I, I, as I get in the truck to take off on my errands, mother comes out. I see this commotion and the sister's gesturing, mother wants you, mother wants you. And I, what does she want me for? Uh, what would I forget? So I park the truck and I'm doing, now going through the crowd and they're all abuzz. And she's at the door entrance. And I walk up, yes, mother, what? And she said, you forgot breakfast. And she handed me a peanut butter sandwich and a banana. You know, and I think back on that and I think that was where she was. It was the individual person it was their needs, and she delighted in it. She said that a life that's not lived for others is not worth living. A great quote that's always stuck with me and reminded me of, uh, of how uh, you get the, uh, well, nurses know this, you know, the joy of service. You get deferred comp. You get deferred comp. Uh, the last time I saw Mother Teresa was uh, 10 weeks before she died. She had come to the United States. She received the Congressional Gold Medal uh, in Washington. At this point, she was in her wheelchair. She was in enormous back pain. I tell in Chapter 14, the last 48 hours of her life, it's fascinating, and the chapter before that talks about her aging. Um, but I, I tell in detail those last 48 hours because she, she was human, and she was like us all. You know, she was taking pain medicine. Her back was killing her. 
you know, uh, and her sister, she had a nurse caring for her, an Irish woman trained as a nurse. Um, she had two doctors that were her sisters. So she was getting medical care. Uh, <clears throat> so Mary and I and the three kids at the time had gone up to follow around uh, in Washington and then up to the Bronx. And so we get up to the Bronx um, and I'm on the third floor of the convent. They're going over the business matters, the missionaries of charity, some of the legal issues that she was facing at the time. And uh, I was stretching the meeting out because I knew I'd never see her again. And uh, this uh, sister finally came up and stood behind the wheelchair handles. And that was signaling to me that it was time for mother to go lay down. And I just said, mother, before you go, uh, Mary and the kids are down in, on the, in, in the courtyard. They're playing. Can they come up and get your blessing? And before I could finish my request, she had already stood up from her wheelchair. I'll never forget this. She looked out the window. She just said, where are the children? She just had this look of wonder. She wanted to play. Where are the children? You know, this is the fruit of a life lived for others. This was the woman that she was, the mother that she was, the leader that she was. Mothers are leaders. The shepherd that she was, that had assumed the care of others. You know, to go from age 18 in Albania uh, to say goodbye to her mother on that train platform, never to see her mother again, to go across the world, to never leave India for 30 years, basically stay in Calcutta that entire time, to serve in obscurity. How is it possible that we even know of this woman and, and can talk about her today? You know, well, this was, of course, a grace at work in the world. And she said she loved all religions. She was in love with her own. And as she led, she was led. She prayed, and she also received the love of the people in her life that, that mattered to her, the friendships that she had. She took a Sikh couple, Anita and Naresh, uh, Sunita and Naresh Kumar to meet the Pope, you know, to take, the, they, she said, come, you got to come meet. So they flew over to Rome and met the, she took them right in to see the Pope, you know, had that great friendship with him. I wrote about that in the book, but it was, you know, her leadership, her caring, her service, that deferred comp that she got at the end of life, that it was a, the satisfaction of a life well lived, a life lived for others, and it's never too late. And so um, she was asked, uh, at the very end by a, uh, a politician, you know, don't you get discouraged because you've been doing this now for 50 years. And for every person you pick up, there's still 10 people out there dying alone. Nothing seems to have changed a lot. Don't you get discouraged? And she said, no. She said, God doesn't call me to be successful. God calls me to be faithful. And I think that that's a, a closing lesson for the school, as you train nurses, the recognition of being faithful, it can be a religious basis. It can be solidarity with your fellow men and women. It can be motivated by any different number of ways. But that notion of not quitting on others, being present to others, accompanying others in their illness, to see nurses that are willing to go and enter into areas like we see them all over the world, dealing with the sick and suffering, it's inspirational and a reminder of the, the joy that comes from servant leadership. This was a, a leadership that Marion experienced. This is one that Mother Teresa, of course, portrayed for the world. And it's a reminder for us that uh, she said once, she said, what I can do, you cannot do. And what you can do, I cannot do. But together, we can do something beautiful for God. And that's what she lived by, and I hope it encourages you. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about Mother Teresa. Thank you. You're most welcome. Are you going to ask questions? I'm going to make sure that everybody asks questions. Good afternoon. I'm Joyce Fitzpatrick, director of the Marion K. Shaughnessy Nurse Leadership Academy. And I want to thank Jim Tui for being with us and for his message of to love and be loved. You know, in nursing, we consider Mother Teresa the very best nurse for what she did. You know, we revere her. Mm -hmm. 
And so we have learned from you. I read the book and I also was oriented to five wishes. And I was uh, never knew that Jim Tui was the architect of five wishes, but went through the five wishes when my brother died. And now I know where it came from. So thank you for five wishes as well. And you all have a copy of that at, at, at your seat. So we do want to hear from you. We want to know if you have questions or comments for Jim. And we do have a microphone here. So right. we see the first question that comes up. I did want to say something about five wishes because it's this this document now is in 31 languages. It's used all over the world, but it's used in America. Ohio's got some very strange advanced directive laws, by the way. Ohio's not on the forefront of this movement, and I don't know why that is. You probably do, but um, but it but it's used it's used even in Ohio. Uh, it's just got different requirements that make it really complicated. Yeah. Have a lot of room to grow in Ohio. No, I'm sure you're leading the way. But anyway, yeah, I'm happy to answer questions about five wishes too. You also have microphones um, in front of you that are, are live as well. So feel free to use that. Um, you just tap the, uh, it says push on the front. You can just speak right into that with your question as well. Thank you very much for that enriching presentation. Thank you. In all walks of life, people have detractors. It's, it's just part of life. Did Mother Teresa have detractors? And if so, how did she deal with them? Great question. I devote a full chapter to rebuttals of the criticisms that she experienced when she was alive and then since her death. On the internet now, she's trolled by people that present things that simply aren't true. So I, one of the reasons I wanted to write the book was to set the record straight. I could only spend 5,000 words on it, so it's a chapter. But uh, the principal areas of criticism that she faced, Christopher Hitchens was probably her biggest uh, public critic at the time. He wrote a book called The Missionary Position, uh, which was a criticism of Mother Teresa's life and work among the poor, factually inaccurate in places, inaccurate in other places. It was a mixture, as all effective detraction is, isn't it? Um, about where did the money come from that she got? Did she hoard the money? Did she deprive the sick of pain medicines? Was she in cahoots with pedophile priests? You, you, that, these are kind of some of the criticisms that, that are out there today. And so they have to be rebutted. You can't just dismiss them. So the book goes into that, but she did. I remember when Hitchens book came out, I saw mother uh, and I told her about the book and she, she looked at me and she goes, why would he write the book? And I said, well, he's a provocateur. I mean, if you've read any of Christopher Hitchens, he actually wrote some beautiful uh, accounts of his own journey and illness and terminal illness at the end of his life, some stunning, uh, insightful uh, passages about his own experience. And, and uh, I invited him to come. I, when I was president at St. Vincent College, I invited him to come to our campus in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, uh, because I was doing a 10 year anniversary on mother's death and I wanted him to meet the real mother, not the one of his imagination, not the one of innuendo, not the one of one bitter man in Calcutta that had an ax to grind with mother and passed out all this information that was past, patently untrue. So yeah, she, she said, well, so when I said that, she was puzzled why I wrote it. And then she said, well, we must pray for him. Jan Petrie told me, Jan was a very close friend of mother. She told me of how excerpts of the book were published in Rome and, and mother was there after Washington when I saw her. And mother said, I want, she, Jan tried to hide the thing and mother said, read it to me. So she wasn't above it. She wanted to hear what was said, but she wasn't vain about that stuff either. You know, she suffered celebrity. She didn't want it. She didn't seek it. Her first public speech was in 1960 and it was in the United States, believe it or not. Her first trip to the United States, 1960. You know where it was? Anybody? Las Vegas. So if you want to go on a pilgrimage to uh, commemorate that, yeah, she woke, spoke to the National Council of Catholic Women, her first public speech. And uh, so she suffered. She hated having her photo taken. 
she she said a soul got out of purgatory every uh, time her photo was taken. So she she would, you know, she was very, she just didn't understand that so much. But she um, she could laugh at herself. I remember, and I tell a story in the book about one time when I asked her not to do something, and she was signing things without having them reviewed. And she got older. She was just so trusting, so ready to say yes. So I just said, you can't do this, you know. You've got to have this stuff reviewed, but you can't just trust the person's presentation in front of you. This is a document has to be read. And she just very humbly said, oh, I messed that up. You know, she she could laugh at herself. And uh, then I felt bad about correcting Who am I to correct her? <laughs> correct her. So she's, she accepted it, but uh, she was interested in the truth. You know, and she went to confession as a Catholic, you know. She didn't go in the confessional with nothing to confess. You know, she had... She had imperfections in her life and she was impatient with sisters when she corrected them. And, you know, so she was, she always saw her life as a growth. And, uh, and, and that included, I think she benefited from when people did say, why do you do it this way instead of that way? She would listen and try to do the right thing. Yes, in the back. <clears throat> Thank you. I don't, I don't have a question. Just, um, I wanted to share a little story that reminded me uh, came to mind is something that you said. Um, I have a, had a dear friend who died a couple of years ago who was a medical missionary for about 40 years, and she spent nine to 10 months out of every year overseas uh, working in a leprosy clinic and a TB clinic. And she met Mother Teresa when she had gone to Nepal early in her career. And she, this woman had multiple uh, degrees. She was very educated, and she thought she would go and help Mother Teresa, like set up these uh, these labs and sort of to your experience thinking you would go on a tour um, uh, my friend was actually uh, met Mother Teresa and she said today I need you to work in the latrines <laughs> <laughs> digging latrines while she was there but my friend wrote a, a book about her own experiences and and her mother Teresa was a great inspiration wow. to her and her favorite quote of Mother Teresa's uh, was something that I pl think applies to the medical, the nursing profession, that the greatest disease is not leprosy or TB. It is um, that the fact that people are uncared and unloved. Yeah. Mother Teresa addressed that so well. So thank you for sharing Thank you story. for sharing that. And yeah, she spoke a lot about loneliness. I would drive her in the United States. Uh, you know, I remember one time in, in, in one of the poorest neighborhoods, probably the poorest neighborhood in Washington, D.C., which is her convents are always in the worst places. In, in America, uh, I think the nearest, there's one in Gary, Indiana, near here. Um, we were driving and she was looking out the window and saw the homeless and just saw people, you know, despairing, you know, seeming to despair, just sitting there in the morning drunk. And um, she just said, you're poor, so hard to reach here. You know, she, she, recognize that that loneliness, that feeling of being unloved, unwanted, unwelcome was uh, was so hard to reach. Only love could really begin to help that person come more at peace with their God-given dignity. Um, yeah, I think that, that she spent a lot of her life combating. And that's why she opened so many homes in America. Outside of India, there's no country with more of her missions than the United States. And I think it's because she saw that terrible spiritual poverty. You know, I used to only think of poverty in material terms, you know, and I didn't realize how poor I was until I met her. And uh, I think she opened the world's eyes to that. And, and, I, and there's a chapter in the book on the darkness that she lived. She, she had this very intimate prayer life with Jesus and then nothing for decades. She felt abandoned. And if you read her letters, so there's a chapter on this. She felt unloved, rejected. Where are you, God? You know, so she she was allowed to experience that forsakenness that our poor experience of being unwanted and rejected and pushed to the margins of society. So she she uh, experienced that spiritually in her own life, where she felt that way. I I I was stunned by it when I when I uh, learned about it. Father Brian had sent me the galleys for his book, Come Be My Light, that had all her letters in it that revealed this. I, I called her successor, Sister Nirmala, her, probably her best friend. I said, do you know this? No. She never complained about it, never talked about it. Extraordinary. I mean, if I had dryness like that, I would have been complaining to everybody, you know? She didn't, but she didn't, but she had cheerfulness and 
She said it was a cloak. It wasn't an insincerity. It was that she maintained that hope in the face of despair. So, uh, and in darkness, she had that trust. She had the faith and hope, which leads to love, those two logical virtues. So, yeah, she, um, that's a long answer on the loneliness, but her response, I guess, because she, she felt it herself in a strange way. Yes, sir. Jim, thanks for all your comments. You, you are broaching a to topic that uh, currently I'm being treated for cancer and uh, the, the notion of spiritual well-being and spiritual health. Uh, is is a difficult topics to address uh, to address on an institutional basis, but I, I think you know it intersects with a lot of areas that you talk about, say loneliness and and the notion of loneliness and and healing physically uh, and and certainly mentally. Uh, that's one of the the things that I've learned is that you know we're we're inadequately prepared to address things mentally because we'll drive ourselves crazy. You know, it's it's through that spiritual dimension that we find that hope. Um, can you address maybe the, the challenge of taking your message and uh, integrating spirituality into institutional health care? Sure. Great question. How are you doing, by the way? I think good. I don't know. Uh, end Hi. of August, I'll have a a progress report. All right. God bless you. Well, that's why I wrote Five Wishes, uh, because I had been around so many people as they died, and I saw that it wasn't just a medical moment. It's a deeply spiritual, personal, emotional moment also, and you can't treat it just like it's a medical moment. And so that's why the wishes talk about comfort. And if you're just going to talk to people about a feeding tube and a ventilator, no wonder most Americans don't fill out an advanced directive. And often the ones they have are worthless, written by a lawyer from a statutory book. No offense to lawyers, I'm one. But, um, but it's in a language people don't understand, and it doesn't apply to care settings. So I had a hospice doctor, Ira Bayok, one of the great ones. And I'm a big fan of palliative care. And I had an emergency room nurse, and I had others input the document as I wanted to create. Because I said, we've got to expand the discussion to also talk in Wish 5, what I want my loved ones to know, to talk about forgiveness to talk about closure, acceptance, regrets. Mother Teresa had a great line when I was, was saying goodbye and telling her how much I was going to miss her and I knew I'd never see her again. Uh, she just looked and I said, I'm going to miss you when you get to the other side. I wasn't talking about India. I was talking about the other side. And, uh, and she said, I got my bags packed. And so she was preparing throughout her life for that moment. She, she knew that death wasn't the end of it. Her faith gave her that certainty, but it's terrifying when you're with people that are dying. It's there's there there is a certain existential uh, terror that has to be addressed. And if you don't, that's why you've got to have spiritual aspects of someone's illness addressed. I'm accompanying a guy right now that's not sure he wants to live. Uh, he's fighting cancer that's metastasized and. And, but he's coming to grips now with all his life's regrets and all his mistakes. And he's, you know, so to try to help a person make peace with their past. You know, this is what has to be done. And so this was meant to be an education tool, not just a legal document, but a tool to help people have these discussions and also to talk to their family members. You know, so Wish 5 talks about, you know, I want my family members to know I forgive them for what they did to me if they harm, you know, if they hurt me. And, and I ask your forgiveness. You know, some people can't even say it, but they want the they don't want to keep their daughter in the doghouse for eternity. So they want them to know, yeah, I did ultimately forgive you. You know, people got a lot of consolation to this. I wish for my for my family and friends to get counseling if they have trouble with my death. I want my memories, want memories of my life to give them joy and not sorrow. You know, communicating things, so this leads to big discussions. People have pen pages to their five wishes. So that's why. We give this out to free for people that can't afford it. Um, $25 gets you 25 copies. We didn't raise the single copy price. All of it goes to a not-for-profit, Aging with Dignity, where I now hang my hat. And that's why I'm marrying this to the, to the book, because now, uh, and I'm detouring a little, uh, but I, I worry about, I understand the appeal of assisted suicide and euthanasia. I understand its appeal because we've, sometimes we just tie people to the medical care conveyor belt and they don't have their pain managed. And medicine sometimes doesn't know when to stop. 
nurses often are the voice that says, you know, let me explain to you what happens if you get this radiation in the next three months and what your quality of life is going to be after that. You know, so there has to be a discussion about that. I understand the appeal of it. I worry about the right to die for the poor and the disabled because rather than give them support services, mental health counseling, we're going to give them aid to take their own life. And this is what's happening now in Canada. And it's, it's, so that's my private belief. I respect people that come to a different conclusion and I understand why they might. And I get a lot of mail on this. But um, but that's where I stand on it because I worry about about that. But I think more important, instead of these two extremes, let's develop a vision for end of life care that supports people's dignity, that manages their pain, that allows them to be with people uh, that they want to be around and, and be in their own bed if they want to be in their own bed and to be properly informed of what their health care decisions involve. That's why we have Wish 2 talks about life support treatment in terms I want it, I don't want it. I want it if my doctor thinks it'll help, but if they don't, I want it stopped. You know, it gives people some choice and some ways to communicate this and to appoint a healthcare agent to be their advocate by their bedside. Yes. Thank you very, very much for both writing the book and presenting. I think this is uh, needed badly and I'm sure that many of us will continue to spread the word. Um, I'm moving away from the spirituality context while it's very important and continued discussions need to happen, but have one burning question from my perspective. I look at it from the leadership perspective and she has been able to rise to a level that everyone would not just listen to her but will follow what she thinks and so on. And you're absolutely right. It's not that she chased honor, honor chased her. And I'm, I'm interested in your thinking of what were the qualities or what were the attributes that really made her so unique and be able to have such a strength mm. of conviction mm -hmm. and message and do it until her last breath. Great question. Great question. I mean, think about it. She's a woman. It's 1948. It's December 21st, and she's going to walk out into the slum and start on her own. No woman could do the, the archbishop took a year to give permission because he thought he was throwing her to the to a certain death or, you know, he, well, she was convicted. This is what God wanted her to do. And then the first woman joins her a few months later in March, one of her old students, then a second student joins, then a third student joins. This is all within four months. But when you read her journals, she was crying. She was rejected by the Loretta sisters, felt like she was going to steer vocations to her, which she did. She ultimately, these girls did join her. So she put up with a lot of that, and uh, but she was convicted. Well, as a leader, rule one is lead by example. So she led by example. She didn't talk it, she walked it, and she, and these women joined. The, the fourth woman that joined quit after 11 days. It's too hard. So she was out. But by the end of the year, 12 people. By the end of the first 10 years, she had 119 women. By the end, by 1975, 300, you know, and then it took off. Not, I'm sorry, 1965, 300. 1975, 1,000. Why would these women follow her? Well, I think, too, she, she had a certain charisma that was, you know, she was a, all grit. You know, she was Albanian to the bone. She was tough. She was, she was purposeful, and, and she was so in love with God. And uh, people, there, there was just an attraction to that. When I met Mother, I just she was just different from anybody, you know? Now, obviously I knew all of her reputation and that can influence it, but, but I just watched her do little things. Like when she was with President Reagan, she treated him, she was respectful of authority of people. I write about it in the book. I talk about her relationship with Hillary Clinton, Princess Diana, President Reagan, Pope John Paul II. The, 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 it was just interesting to see how she was with these people. And then when she'd be at the bedside of a guy with, that had AIDS, you know, she was present to them, you know, and she, she, uh, 
well, she just challenged these women to give their all. And then the men, the brothers started and the priest started. I, I, I live with the MC fathers for you. I thought I was going to be maybe be a priest, you know, and uh, it was I have five kids, so I wasn't going to be a priest. But uh, um, I tell that story it begins on page 84. You'll love it about Mary and me and how we met. Uh, but as a leader, she had a vision. She led by example. She was the first in the chapel. She got up at 440 every morning. She was the last one to bed. Uh, she, she was authentic. Uh, she, the sisters, I asked them all, I said, what was the characteristic of mother that you liked the most? This was of the early group. Cause I've now been back to Calcutta 20 times. And I would go back there to ask them these, the older women that were in that first group, like sister Gertrude, she was a number two one. Sister Agnes, the first one. What was it? All of them said the same thing. She was merciful. She was forgiving. And, I, and you never think of that characteristic of a leader. Uh, but in fact, this is what it instills loyalty among people when they see a leader that's not going to hang you out to dry when you make a mistake. You know, so she would correct her sisters, but she, so those qualities come to mind. Her, her enthusiasm, her um, humility, she was a servant. So she led from below, not from above. She didn't lord authority over people. Uh, all of that comes to mind. You know, that's what a servant leader does. They lead from below. They wash the feet. They, and, and you talk about latrine work. I mean, uh, mother, her favorite job was to clean the latrine in, in Kaligat because no one wanted to do it. You know, so she would always do these things. Well, this is what a parent does. This is what mothers do. This is what grandmothers do. They make sacrifices for others. You know, it's not just unique to saints, you know. So she made those sacrifices generously. <laughs> it's a great question. Hi. Hi. It's nice to meet you, and thank you for being here. I am a nurse and um, directly work with patients regularly. And I come across many patients who have different beliefs or they um, maybe don't believe in the care they're receiving, they have a range of emotions. And similarly to the previous question about leadership, I have a question about her ability to care in the lived experience when she's working with the patient who's angry or who's volatile or the, um, I'm sure the abusive person who came to visit someone, all of these very real experiences that when you go to live, I can't imagine going in to a slum and working, but um, how she addressed those types of things. Did she use her, I read a bit about her and her you know, very kind of um, her personality that had, she had grit. Did she set limits with her patients? How did she relate to them as she was dealing with all of the complexities that come about when people are sick and dying and part of a family and all of those things? Yeah. Well, it's difficult to be around people who suffer. When you're a nurse, your, your heart is almost a sponge. You just absorb the pain of people. Going back to my friend's question, spiritually, you know, mother assured them of God's love for them, that she believed that they were made in the image and likeness of God. And she didn't talk about a Christian God or, you know, she was, in as I said, she loved all religions, but was in love with her own. But, but that spiritual strength that she got gave her, I guess, an inner conviction to stand there in the midst of pain and suffering. Uh, she, well, she of course thought of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the foot of the cross. This was why on the crucifix she wore, it's the standard Catholic crucifix, but it has Mary right there etched on the crucifix at the side of the cross. I think she saw herself that way, you know, and so, to be able to be in the midst of pain like that, she prayed a lot. She prayed in the morning. She prayed midday with her sisters. She took her siesta. They did their afternoon prayer. They did their night prayer. 
So she, and she always sent her sisters away for three weeks for retreat every year. They would go on a retreat and just get spiritually recharged, get some sleep. <laughs> uh, the sisters are always exhausted. I see them, they're my friends all over the world now. And I go, I go to good talks and, and Mary and I just have such a debt to them. We love these women and these priests, the men I've gotten to know, I, they're great men. Um, so she prayed and without that, you know, that orientation, I'll tell a quick story. Uh, when, when, uh, Mary was pregnant with our third, we were living in Tallahassee, but mother was coming to Washington and we didn't think we'd ever see her again. So we wanted to get the baby blessed. And so we drove, you know, we, we had the other, uh, our lovely children, uh, we left at home, flew up for a day trip. And uh, that time they were five, three, and one, you know, so we had someone watch them, you know, and we flew up for a day trip. We're walking, mother sees Mary, and she goes, oh, you're pregnant, when do you do? And Mary says, well, I'm, I'm uh, due August 8th, but I think I'm gonna be early. And mother said, no, you'll have that baby on my birthday. And I said, mother, your birthday's August 26th. You know, if Mary's 18 days late, my life's gonna be a living heck. So long story short, night of August 25th, Mary goes into labor. We're like, oh my gosh, the angels are at work. We're going to have a little girl. We're going to name her Teresa. Midnight strikes, 1.20 in the morning. Out comes the baby. And the doctor says, congratulations, you have a little boy. And Mary said, are you sure? <laughs> he said, like, here's how we tell. It was simple like this in the old days. Um, so uh, while Mary's still in the hospital, uh, I get uh, Sandy McMurtry, mother's very close friend, gets a call from sister Priscilla saying, you and Jim should come back if you can, mother's not going to make it. And so um, we, uh, my mom came over, I had with Mary's blessing, take the little photo of Maximilian. She'll be delighted to know her son was born as she predicted. We get to Calcutta, Sandy and I arrive there. The sisters meet us, mother, we've got to go straight to the hospital. Mother's on auction. I'm just like, get there, please. I want to see her before she dies, you know? And so we rush to the hospital and, um, and we, we, uh, I get to the sixth floor there of Woodlands. It's, uh, she's got this area that where intensive care bed was, but outside of it was the sisters were gathered a few, you know, six or eight of them. And they were all, and I just thought, Oh, did, they were in a buzz of activity. I thought, did mother just die? You know, did mother die? I thought I'd missed, you know, and she said, no, she said, mother was laying there and she had her oxygen mask on and she was looking up and they all were looking up to see what is she, is she having a vision or what is she looking at? And she said, uh, she saw their confusion and she took the mask to the side and she said, I'm going home. I'm going home to God. That's what she told her sisters. Well, that was her orientation. She had a compass and, and I, I, I don't, I mean, spiritually, I've, I've had so many friends of all different faiths um, and I don't, I don't have to figure that out, <laughs> but I do believe that people that have a sense of their ex, their existence and its meaning and purpose. And, but she, she had that compass. So she knew where she was heading in the midst of suffering. And she had that compass in the midst of other suffering that she truly believed God loved them, that they were God's children. And that gave her enormous consolation, even if they were angry and they, and they did vent at her. They, it's these guys that can't, that feel they're unlovable. They can't bear to be loved. So when someone's kind to them, it's such a break. They can't accept it. They cannot receive it. And so she, um, she was in the midst of a lot of pain and anger. I saw it in Kali God, all my visits there, you would just see people flipping the food and, you know, but then you'd see them over time. There would be change. You know, they would slowly accept that they won't, they weren't hateable, you know, that there was some good in them. And then they made their peace. I, I'll close that part with the, the, the answer with, there was a sign in Kaliga that caught my attention the, the first day. I write about this in the book. And it said, the greatest aim of human life is to die in peace with God. And, uh, and it puzzled me. I was like, the greatest aim? I thought it was, to, you know, be a saint or a sanctity or not. But it wasn't a destination. It was a process. And that's why she prayed every day that prayer of Francis, you know, make me a channel of your peace that where there's hatred, I may bring love where there's wrong. I may bring the spirit of forgiveness where there's discord. You know, you may know that prayer, but it, it was, 
it was her, you know, to be, I'd rather to be understood rather than to, to be understand rather than to be understood, to love rather than to be loved. Or it's probably forgetting self that one finds. Well, this was her journey as a religious. This is what she inspired her sisters to love, to be in the face of that, in the midst of that, and to try to respond the way Christ did as they understood it. And she did it. Maybe one more question. I don't want to keep people too long because I know when you have a reception that follows, but we can take, I'll go as long as you want, but I don't want to. You know. I have a quick question from someone on Zoom. They asked, did anybody, uh, Chris asked, did anybody take Mr. Toohey to the Albanian garden at Cleveland Cultural Gardens to see the Mother Teresa statue? No. How far is that from here? Oh, it's over here. Oh, tell the Zoomer that it's done. It's going to happen. I got to see that. I want to, I can't wait to hear Joyce's stories because she went to Albania. It's something I've wanted to do. And this guy said, you can't write the book till you go there, but COVID was happening. Jim, thank you so much for being here. And I loved your presentation, but could you share with us a little bit about how, when you met Mother Teresa, how, what changed in your life? What, what were the things that changed for you as a human being? Wow. Well, uh, I wrote it in the book at length to try to describe how she changed my life, how God changed my life through her. She said that she was a pencil in the hand of God that he wrote love letters to the world with. So she saw herself as a pencil. And so people were, I, I, I love going to places where people say that I met mother briefly and the impact it had on their life. You know, it was amazing how many people she touched uniquely, but, um, well, I had to first confront my own hypocrisy. Uh, well, that's always a work in progress, right? You can ask my wife. Uh, we all take time to go after the speck in the spouse's eye and instead of the plank, in, you know, that's in our own eye. I loved Dorothy, uh, Catherine Do Heck Doherty had a sign up in her office. She said, love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. You know, so it was first just a desire to live in the truth stop lying to myself, you know, and then to, to try to live the joy of the gospel. Well, you know, as Peggy Noonan once described, you know, there's something wrong with us humans, you know, that we keep messing things up. Look at the world today, right? So this has been going on a while, but to acknowledge that recognition, but also to realize that doesn't have the final answer that grace abounds, where sin abounds. And so I had to make life changes in my life, try to follow the teachings of the church was a start. I wasn't, you know, and, uh, and then to just try to be less selfish. And, you know, the, I tell the story in the book of the gospel that was read that day at that mass, that, that seminal day. And the priest homily was about, there are two types of people. He said, you're either a gatherer or a giver. And I wrote about that at length, but uh, I had to confront that question. Well, what was I? Cause I kind of, oh, I can be a gatherer and a giver, you know, but I didn't understand the question until you got deeper into the, to the poor. Well then for 20 years, the poor entrusted to marrying me were our kids. You know, we, we weren't able to be at the soup kitchen and the AIDS home like we had been. And so we, you know, that was who was entrusted us. So did, the, I understood a little differently, but in the midst of that, you found God. She said, whatever you did to the least you did, to God. And so she truly said that was Jesus in his disguise of the poor. That was a school I had to enter for me. And I'm respectful of all faiths. And I want to be very clear for people who aren't the Christian faith. I, you know, this is my journey. I respect yours. And in fact, Abram Heschel had more of influence on me spiritually, my early years than anyone. Uh, God in Search of Man, other books he wrote. So all that's to say, I'm a work in progress. Uh, but by God's grace, you know, I can see the difference, you know, what my life would have been had I not met her. I can't even imagine how I would have lived it. I can't imagine it. I can't imagine life without mother, you know, so I feel like I got to pay it back. And, uh, and five wishes, I'm thankful. I see God is using to help families have these discussions and to plan for it. She has a question there. One more. Should we do one more? Is that okay? Sure. One more. Great. Um, thank you for being here today. And I have to admit, when I came, I came to learn more about Mother Teresa, and I didn't have any idea what this five wishes was 
about or that it would be presented. I'm also a nurse. Um, I work across the street in the medical ICU for the last 15 years, and I've helped a lot of people die in not at home, not at peace wow. um, in, in the ICU. And I've seen a lot of um, just glossing over of hospice and palliative care and, and those comfort measures. And of course, this is ideal to present to people and loved ones prior to coming to the hospital. Right, right. Is there any, um, what advice do you have for initiating this in the hospital setting? Like what, because this is the first, I did not know this existed and I'm ashamed to admit that I did not know that this existed and I, I feel it could be very helpful. But along those same lines, you. You have to be cautious, of course, especially as a in the registered nurse role. But how would what are some tips that you would offer to present this to even loved ones um, if the patient is not able to communicate at that at that time? Yeah. Well, it's I think one of the reasons you may not be familiar with it is because Ohio's unique uh, unique rules. Uh, it says the, 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 in, on page three in your hymnal there. Uh, if you live in one of four states, Kansas, New Hampshire, Ohio, or Texas, you can still use Five Wishes, but may need to take an extra step. And then you go to fivewishes.org. So it could be usable, used, but Ohio has weird rules. Um, but like in Colorado and Denver, every hospital is using it there. And they use it at intake. They use it in their community nurse programs and in their parish nurse programs and education efforts. Hospices are big, obviously, in Five Wishes. They use it a lot. Um, so we, we talk about it as a discussion tool and not as a legal document that freaks people out. But it can be, it's legally valid. And I believe it's legally valid in Ohio. And I'll, I'm happy to defend a lawsuit here if it ever came to that. It wouldn't. The, as you described, the problem is you've got the wrong form. The problem is you have no form. There's no discussion. And then the family feud breaks out at the bedside from the distraught sister who just arrived that wants the works and the other one that been sitting there at ground zero saying they want to go home to God. And so then you get one of these and then the ethics committee, right? Blah, blah, blah. You know this drill well. So to try to get that upstream is we ask physicians to give them to their patients at regular checkups. We ask people to talk about it. We ask employers to give it to their employees so they can be there for their parents when they need them the most. And so we, we've, we're, we're trying to get it further upstream and to have conversations at Thanksgiving. People go, why would you ruin Thanksgiving talking about feeding tubes? And, uh, and the answer is because if you don't have these discussions, every Thanksgiving after your mom dies will be ruined by the trauma that can happen if you don't have these discussions. And then I love, I did it with two people in their mid eighties uh, recently. The peace of mind they had when they were done, they were in their mid eighties, you know, <laughs> it never, and then they're and then the kids and the, you know it gets complicated i understand that but i think people if they know what the parents wishes are they'll honor them even if they disagree with them so yeah i you you now are officially authorized as an ambassador of aging with dignity and we'll get you a lifetime supply of five wishes so you can tell valeria and we'll get your info but uh we would love for it i mean this is this is the vatican of healthcare. I mean, the Cleveland Clinic, what you have here, this is so impressive. Take it. For, I feel like I'm in the Beverly Hillbillies just like gawking, you know, but to see all the specialized care here this is extraordinary. This isn't how America is. So you all are blessed. But then that with that comes a responsibility. So good luck with that. But that's why Joyce is here, because she's doing this leadership program that's going to help have nurses do this. So well, and that's why we know that Marion Shaughnessy is with Mother Teresa by her side, urging us on. Amen. So thank you so much, Jim, for being with us. We do have books, if you would like, we have books um, that Jim Tui has signed, if you would like to buy a copy of To Love and Be Loved. We would be glad to sell those to you. And as Jim said, the, the royalties go to charity. So uh, also we have a reception. So we ask all of you to join us for a reception with Mr. Tui so you can ask more questions. So Jack uh, Fitzgerald, where is our reception? 
I will just be heading down to uh, the South Winter Garden. Uh, so just uh, can take the elevator or the stairs um, here to the left of the build or left of the room. And um, as Dr. Fitzpatrick mentioned, we'll have uh, books available. You'll see a table when you go down there. So I uh, will see you down there. Thank you.